So welcome to Gen AI and Open Educational Resources in Teaching and Learning. Um, I'm Lucas Wright. I, I recognize a lot of you. I'm a senior educational consultant, the CTLT, and I've been doing some research and playing with and working with AI now for the last couple of years. And uh, previous to that, I actually worked in the OER space quite a bit with uh, Will, my colleague. Hi, everybody. I also recognize a lot of people today and, and a few I don't know. I'm Will Ingle. I'm a strategist for open education initiatives um, at the CTLT, and I primarily focus on um, working with instructors and students who want to use open educational resources or open educational practices in their teaching and learning. And I'm really excited to uh, be here in this session today and working with Lucas, who has a lot of expertise on the AI uh, in the AI and the OER spaces. Um, with that, I think uh, before we begin, we'd like to acknowledge that UBC Vancouver, which is hosting this session, is located on the, tra the traditional ancestral and unceded territories of the Musqueam people. Um, and as we're going to be talking about open education today, I'd like to acknowledge that much of open education is grounded in Western notions of copyright law and ownership, and this can be intentions, intention with indigenous and traditional ways of knowing. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about that, that tension today, um, but we're not going to do a deep dive into that topic. Um, but I do want to just post a link to a recording of a session that was done earlier um, by Kayla Larson, who is the Indigenous Indigenous uh, Programs and Services Librarian at Weewa Library here at UBC. Um, and she hosted a session that, that directly explored these tensions. And it's a really fantastic. If you have time and you're interested in this topic, I really encourage you to, to watch it. I'm just going to drop a link to that recording. Uh, in the chat. So today we're going to be talking specifically um, about Gen AI and OER. So we'll provide just a, a really quick introduction to what Gen AI and OER is, is and then talk more detail about how Gen AI can be used for OER. And then we're going to spend some time after we kind of go through that talking about what are the issues and tensions that exist between AI and OER, and then thinking about future directions that AI might be pushing OER. Um, we hope you leave the session today with um, a bit of an understanding of how AI can be used to support or enhance the creation adoption um, of OER, but also considerations for the use of, of OER, such as privacy, equity, bias, and copyright, um, PEBC, we're, we're abbreviating. Um, and also then thinking a little bit about the implications of the future of o OER and where OER is going. Um, and then talk, you know, if we're lucky today, by the end of the session, we hope you'll leave with maybe a draft section of an open textbook um, done. So we'll see how that goes. Wonderful. And um, just to kind of focus a little bit, and do you mind sharing that link when you get a chance, Well, to focus a little bit more on interaction today, we've created a worksheet and it's not visible on the agenda, but we have interactive activities built throughout this session. So we encourage you to interact in a couple ways. One is when we come to the activities, um, if you go down the worksheet, you'll see the activities and participate that way. We're not gonna be using breakout rooms. We're gonna be doing them all together and sharing. Secondly is as we go through prompts, and discussing different prompts for OER, feel free to pop open ChatGPT4 or 4 Omega or MS Copilot and uh, try some of the prompts out yourself. I think by playing with these tools and experimenting, it's probably the best way to dive into them and learn a little bit. I'll mention at UBC right now, when we look at these three tools, um, ChatGPT 3.5 and MS Copilot are the only tools that currently have a privacy impact assessment successfully completed. What that means is you can use those tools responsibly within your classroom. So thanks for sharing that, Will. And again, every activity we get to just scroll down the worksheet to find the particular activity. So let's start with a bit of an introduction to open educational resources and Gen AI. And I'll start with this definition of Gen AI from Wikipedia, just as a reminder for most of you at this point. So as compared to more traditional AI, such as Netflix recommendations, um, generative AI generates something new. And it does this by scraping data or using data from different data sources, and then creating images, text, 
or other data. And just a reminder that every time you run a prompt on ChatGPT or Gemini, the output is unique and it's original. That That's to the point where I actually can't get it to repeat the same output. So just to kind of clarify, it's not going to the web and finding text, it's recreating text based on algorithms. What, what is it trained on? And I think as we talk a little bit more about these tools and as we look at these tools critically, it's important to look at the data they were trained on to find things like biases, think about things like intellectual property, and also understand the nature of what we're drawing from. So one of the sources for ChatGPT 3.5 is the common, call, common crawl training data set. And that's 13 years of archived websites. So it's not the whole internet that's archived. It's specific websites that have been archived. Um, billions of pages in over 40 languages, predominantly English, and trillions of links. So if you have a personal website, a university website, if you've used things like Reddit, Twitter, there's a good chance that your data is being used with tools like ChatGPT 3.5. And I only say ChatGPT 3.5. What's interesting is more and more money is poured into these tools and more development has happened. We know less and less about how, we're, how they've been trained. ChatGPT 3.5 was quite open about this. The second data set, the ChatGPT 3.5 trained on is a very controversial data set, and that's Books 3. Books 3 has 196,000 books in its database, and many of these books are copyrighted. Um, some of them are open, many are copyrighted, and to kind of experiment with that, pick out your favorite book that you've read recently, ask for a summary of it, ask for a worksheet based on that book, and most often it will be able to do that. I did a workshop a few months ago with a faculty member from law and they found some specific information in ChatGPT that was only in a journal. It was a topic area only they had written about and it was in a private journal. Somehow these tools have accessed it. And thirdly is all of the data from Wikipedia. So a source, when we're talking about OER, you know, which is our open data has now been used and helps to create results within these models. So I'm going to turn it over to Will, who's going to talk a little bit about what OER is with us. Sure. So open education is a bit of an umbrella term, but essentially can really be understood as a collection of practices that utilize online technologies and open copyright licenses to, to facilitate collaborative, flexible learning and sharing with the goal to remove access barriers to education, as well as to empower both instructors and students. Um, OER is one aspect of open education. So um, OER is abbreviation for open educational resources. And OER are teaching and learning resources. And they can include things like full courses, specific modules, textbooks, videos, problem sets, assessments, and really any other materials that are free of cost barriers and which also carry legal permission for open use. And this legal permission um, often takes the form of what's called an open copyright license. And the open copyright license works within the framework of copyright to give permission um, to that give permission for other people to reuse the materials. Um, so this permission is granted by the use of these these open copyright licenses. Um, Creative Commons is the most commonly used um, open copyright license for OER. And they allow anybody to freely use, adapt, and share the resource anytime or anywhere. Wonderful. And to get you started, we wanted to jump in right away and kind of do an activity with you. And for this activity, I'm going to demonstrate it and then I'll give you a chance to do it. Um, one of the ways that we can start thinking about open educational resources is the idea of 
what would an open textbook look like if we were able to create it with generative AI? And we're starting to see this more and more with um, textbooks in general. <laughs> if you go on, for example, the Amazon bookstore, you'll find now lots and lots of generated textbooks. Some of these are much worse than others. Um, but what does it mean to have this ability? So I'm just going to stop sharing this slide screen and I'm going to run you through how we might start creating an open textbook and then I'll get you to run the same prompt. So what Will and I thought would be fun to do is think about a textbook around sleep, something I didn't get much of last night because of my daughter. And I'm going to grab this prompt and a couple things to mention in the prompt. I've used a persona stem on the prompt. So as a psychology professor, what we found about prompts is by giving the prompt a persona, we tend to get better output and write a thousand word, extremely detailed textbook section. So it won't get the exact number of words, but it will make a longer text based on this. So write a textbook section of a chapter for first year college students. I've given an audience involved on the processes involved in sleep, include learning objectives at the start and a glossary of terms at the end. So I'm gonna use ChatGPT for Omega for this. Again, this is a tool that is available to anyone who is logged into ChatGPT and you tend to get better quality results then with ChatGPT 3.5, the one you don't need to log into. So let's give that a try now. And it's gonna start giving us a, a chapter. So you'll see the learning objectives, describe different stages of sleep, explain the physiological processes, identify functions of sleep. And now it's walking us through different stages of sleep. What's interesting about this is someone who doesn't have a specialty in sleep, except not getting enough last night, I'm not able to really understand the quality, the amount of errors in this, the amount of inaccuracies in this tool. So we're in an interesting space. I'll talk about this in a little bit, <clears throat> where we have these tools that are 100% confident, but they might be 70% accurate and we really need expertise to understand this, which luckily is something many of you have. So here is the output and here's the glossary of terms at the end. So just to get a feeling for this, what I would like you to do now is to create a chapter section yourself. So I'm gonna give you five minutes and if you go on the worksheet, you'll see this activity there. I'd like you to use the same prompt that I shared. Again, I've linked to it on the worksheet. Edit it and think of a topic in your discipline area, discipline, disciplinary area or an area of expertise you have, something you'll be able to gauge the quality of the output. Use the provided guidelines. So create a single page or section of a chapter of an open textbook. The page should include learning objectives and a glossary of terms. Once you've done that, I'd like you to think on your own what worked, what we're missing, what were some of the challenges, and just generally what was the quality of the output. So I'm going to give everyone five minutes to do that now. Again, use the prompt on the worksheet that I've shared with you and create your own section of an open textbook. And this, you'll find this on page one of the worksheet that I we shared with you. All right. So what I'd like you to do now is share in the chat what the topic of your textbook was and a couple words about kind of your overall evaluation of it. So was it accurate? Was it inaccurate? Just a couple words that come to your mind. So I'll get you to share that in the chat now. And I'm also, if you want to jump on the mic and share that way, please feel free to share your textbook that way. So again, in the chat, what was the topic of the of your text and what were the results of the output? Yeah, Duncan, uh, go ahead. 
Yeah, I'm happy just to to mention it. So um, I, I just I'm not a media studies prof, but that's that's the 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 prompt I used in writing about science communication because I've been giving some lectures about that recently, and uh, it was very thorough. <laughs> I've done these before, but I think the framework of your prompt really like gave it some rigor and. Uh, yeah, it, I, I've had this feeling a couple of times before with uh, Gen AI, but this really, like, it was very complete and thorough and um, even like added to some areas that I hadn't uh, brought up in my in my talks. So um, it was quite good and uh, and a little, uh, uh, <laughs> it, it, I, it was better than I thought it would be is what I'm saying. Okay, noticing. okay. No, yeah. thanks for sharing. And that, I mean, that's such a good point about prompt. I think at this point, the prompting can make such a difference in the quality of the output. And I'm just looking in the chat here, uh, Karen mentioned um, adding expertise to occupational health. The results of the output focused on the latter only, I see. So it only focused on part of what you were looking for. And Nobo did a request with the fluid mechanics of civil engineering. And the outcome is truly impressive and thorough. Nobo, do you mind, are you okay jumping on the mic and kind of explaining like what, how you evaluated it? Like what did thorough and impressive mean for you? Yeah, can you hear me actually? Yeah. Yeah, that was a pretty impressive. It's a, a pretty much cover everything that I have been teaching and the equations and examples are also uh, quite impressive. I suspect that uh, that GPT capable of accessing all the textbooks anyway, <laughs> you know, so, and it is a classical sort of mechanics. So I think it uh, tons of examples already existing, but the way being sort of put together is a very, very useful. No matter of fact, yeah, this is a fantastic way to, you know, prepare my teaching materials as well. Wonderful. Thanks for sharing. Oh, thank you. And I'm looking in the chat, you know, a lot of folks are saying that the outcome was pretty impressive, which is, it's interesting because this is actually the first workshop I've done since 4 Omega came out. With ChatGPT 3.5, I was finding a lot more generalizable. And it's really going to depend on our disciplinary area and how we prompt it. So thanks for sharing that. I'm going to turn over to Will now, who's going to talk to us about creating ancillary resources or quizzes. Yeah, so so we're just going to expand upon this activity a little bit. So textbooks are a pretty traditional form of OER, but one of the big areas um, of growth in OER is the idea of, of creating open problem sets, open quizzes, um, open exams. Um, and these problem sets can be used for summative learning. So you could paste them into your textbook um, so students can read them and, and understand, you know, ask the questions themselves and understand if they understood the materials or they can be used in more formal ways. So we're just going to do the same activity um, where um, using the same uh, topic as your chapter section, we're going to ask a Gen AI um, to create four question um, summary quiz, a four questions uh, summary quiz on that topic. Um, so if you go into the worksheet, we do have a prompt for you. Um, and it's a pretty basic prompt. Um, again, we're going to use that persona as a, for me, we're working on the same topic as Lucas um, of the, the psychology of sleep. And I'm going to say, as a psychology professor, create a summative multiple choice quiz about the psychology of sleep. Create four questions with four alternatives for each question. And I will just note, because I am not an expert in this area, I'm going to ask them to also mark the correct answer with an asterisk. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and take over screen sharing and just demonstrate that. And uh, just to play around with, with a different AI, I'm going to jump into Gemini. Um, and again, Gemini has not gone through a PIA here at UBC, um, but there was no personal data in this question. So I, I feel like I can go ahead and, and use it here. Um, so I'm just going to copy in my, my um, prompt. I'm going to hit return, and you'll see it starts to come back with the question. So it's nicely formatted. Um, it's got an asterisk for the questions um, for the right answer. And it looks like the um, the correct answer is not always the same option, which is great. So it's sort of randomized throughout the um, each alternative. So I'm going to ask you to do the same thing. And then we'll come back together and just have that same sort of discussion of what worked, what was missing, and what were some challenges. Um, so we're just going to take uh, about four minutes to, to go through that right now. 
I will set my timer and we'll come back in four. So just to come back, Duncan, I see that the results are solid, but some of the alternatives um, answers seem a bit too far off. And I was wondering if you could just expand upon that a little bit to, to talk about what you mean by that and, and how you understood that they were too far off. Oh, I, I think they were just too obviously not the correct answer. Like they weren't, they didn't hew close enough to the correct answer to be an effective measure. I think you could just guess uh, what the answers would be, but you could tinker with that um, as it came out or maybe try to um, rejig the pro prompt a bit. L let me let me ask you maybe a, a follow-up question. If you were working with these questions, would they be hard, hard to revise and would the, have this been like a good first step or would it have been more work? to start with something like this and then have to revise sort of the weaker alternatives? No, it would not be more work. It would be an easy first draft that you could then tinker with. So yeah, still uh, productive, but um, just not not as um, as immediately impressive as, as the first prompt where uh, the, the, the chapter was written. One, one quick tip on um, what I've been finding with multiple choice questions. If you can find a researcher who writes about writing effective multiple choice questions in your prompt say write multiple choice questions informed by the research of and put the researcher's name in and often it will help the quality of the output that's a great tip and adele i see you have yeah so i i gave in a little german text that had to deal with integration of foreigners in germany and i asked for multiple uh, choice questions uh, it was done well, but I also found the questions I personally would have had more challenging questions. But uh, I found it interesting to see which topics they picked and addressed. So, uh, yeah, it was worthwhile. It was actually quite impressive. And it was all in German, too. So not only English, which is, which is usually the standard language. Fantastic. And and so a couple themes that I hear that are really interesting to me is, is echoing Lucas's um, comments earlier, the last time we've done this, people have not been quite as impressed with the results. Um, and I think that also leads into this idea that it's, you know, even though we have uh, Gen AI, there's still a lot of expertise needed to be able to um, evaluate um, whether the OER that we're creating um, using Gen AI is, is hitting the mark that we want um, for our students and for our learners. Um, so, so this is, we've created some quizzes um, and uh, they're basically just text-based at this. I do just want to do a quick little demo. Um, a lot of the educational technologies and some of the open educational technologies are understanding that people are using these tools and trying to figure out ways um, that they can be integrated into their systems a little bit. Um, I'm just going to show a quick example of one sort of aspect of this. So if you're not familiar with it, um, we have a tool here at UBC. It's a fantastic tool. Let me just share my screen called H5P. H5P is a um, tool that creates interactive um, internet based text or internet based activities. Um, it can be used for quizzes, it can be used for things like flashcards. Um, it's used sort of all over the place, and it's particularly an open tool. Um, and because you can embed it into different sites, you can add a Creative Commons license uh, to it and allow other people to share and use. Um, so this may or may not work. Again, each time you use uh, a ChatGGP tool or a Gen AI tool, it's creating something completely original. And sometimes, um, sometimes it works great. Sometimes it doesn't work. But people are trying to figure out: Can we get them to to Can we get these tools to output the format? that we need to be able to just ingest it into our AI tools. So I'm going to go to ChatGTP. Um, this is in the worksheet. Um, we're not going to go through it through it um, individually, but just to go together, I put the prompt in. Um, and basically, you'll see this is the same prompt. Um, create a multiple choice quiz about the psychology of sleep. Um, and then it provides some guidance specifically on the format that I wanted to output in, um, particularly as pre-formatted code. Um, so I'm going to put this in. It's going to output the questions in pre-formatted code um, exactly how I'd like, like it. Um, I'm going to go ahead and copy that. And I'm going to jump over to H5P. And in H5P, um, if you've ever used it, um, you can see all these sort of content types you can create. Here, I'm just going to create a quiz um, based on these four um, questions that I've asked it to generate. 
Um, I'm going to just put a quick title. Um, and then I am going to go in, and you can see this is just generally a quiz builder tool, um, but they have a text input. So I'm going to put in the text input from that it put out. There's a little bit of formatting. Um, that's the pre-formatted code formatting that I just want to take out. Um, and then I'm going to go ahead and create this and see what happens. So fingers crossed. Um, but this is generally works pretty well these days, um, particularly with the sort of advances. Um, so here I can see my quiz has been created. I can create, um, answer the question. It's interactive. It provides me feedback. Um, I can try again. And again, there's feedback for every incorrect alternative. Um, I can go through it and do it. I can try it again. And so what we've done is we've taken sort of flat text fakes output and created it in just maybe like three extra steps into interactive content. Um, H5P again is a um, open uh, tool. And with some of the nice things here, I can say reuse, so I can copy the content um, or I can have it embedded. So I can embed this right into Canvas if I'm working on an open textbook and using a tool like Pressbooks or using a website like WordPress, I can embed it directly into that. And then there's rights of reuse. Um, so you'll see because this is an open tool, um, it automatically appends a Creative Commons license to it. So people know exactly how they can, can reuse that content. Um, so we've gone really quickly to creating um, some, some interactive elements uh, for summative studies. Now that we've had a chance to play a little bit with some of the OER or some of the um, AI tools and how they can be used to create content, we're going to talk a little bit about Gen AI as a tool for OER. Um, so OE, OER is a great strategy for creating course content or for course content. So you can adopt pre-existing OER that's out there and that will save both time and money. So online versions of OER, whether it's open textbook or open exams are usually free for students and instructors. And you can often download and save offline versions in multiple formats. And this is really important for people who may have low bandwidth situations or maybe just trying to access the content when they're traveling or on the bus to UBC. Um, there's no access code needed to access OER. There's no expiration date on the OER. And because of the open copyright license that OER has, there's no need to gain permission or pay to use, copy, or distribute those resources amongst an unlimited number of students. Um, you can adapt or customize OER to provide meaningful contextualized resources for your students. Um, and this means you can really modify it to meet your teaching goals, your learning outcomes, your student needs. Um, you can translate it, you can change the format it, and you can make it more reflective of the diversity of experience and backgrounds of students in your, um, in your courses at UBC. And this is one of my favorite things that OER often gets used for. There is a great example where uh, an instructor was using a open psychology textbook um, and noticed that a lot of the examples around families didn't reflect at all um, the families of the back of the students in his courses. So he just, because it was OER, was able to modify it and, and update it with more, more diverse images that reflected the students in his courses. Um, so this is an example of remixing. Um, so you can take OER and combine it with other things such as um, um, open images um, into an existing textbook, or you can combine lots of different resources to make something entirely new. One of my favorite examples uh, was a instructor who uh, took a few chapters from a psychology textbook and a few chapters from a neuroanatomy textbooks and created a brain and behavior open textbook. Um, so because of the open copyright um, licenses of those two textbooks, they were able to combine them. Um, and then finally, and what we're going to be talking a lot about today is, of course, you can always create entirely new content and make it and share it as OER. And Lucas is going to show some examples of how Gen AI can be used um, for these activities that OER is commonly used for. Wonderful. Thanks. And I think one of the challenges that we've had for a long time in the OER space is that um, OERs demand a lot of faculty and staff time in creating them and in adapting them and in adopting them. Yet we know that they're very important for, you know, students really want them for savings. They're helpful, they're a way to customize resources. So perhaps with large language models and generative AI, 
we have a new space in which we can think about leveraging these tools for creation, for adaption, for editing. I'm going to demo some of these. So uh, this is from David Wiley. If you haven't read Wiley, Wiley's blog, he was one of the first folks to start moving the idea of open source software and applying this to educational resources. And he says, LLMs will dramatically increase the speed of creating the informational resources that compromise the content infrastructure, of course. Of course, the drafts of these informational resources will need to be reviewed and improvements will need to be made. And I think we're, uh, according to the new Microsoft Futures of Work report, we're going into a time when there may be less emphasis on searching and writing stuff from scratch and more emphasis on generating and evaluating the output and revising. So one thing we can do with generative AI is to start adapting open resources. And one of the ways we can adapt this, and I'm gonna demo these in a, section, in a second, is we can adapt to simplify or to make a text more complex. So we can basically shift the level of an open educational resource. Second, we can think about the language. And I noticed in the chat, someone was working in a different language. We can use it as a translation tool. We can also shift the format of a text and adapt the format. And finally, we can make our open resource more accessible by asking for things like alt tags. So let me demo this first one. And what I've done in the worksheet, again, I encourage you to follow along and try it out, is I have grabbed a page from an open textbook focused on clear communication by Matt Croslin. So I'm gonna take this page out of the textbook. And again, you may wanna do the same just to practice it. And I'm going to paste this into chat GPT. Whoops. One moment. I'm going to paste this into chat GPT and I'm going to prompt it now. And the first prompt I want to use is act as a learning designer and adapt the following OER for grade 12 learners. So this is typically aimed at a university level. I think first year university. And if you take a look at, you'll see the language and let's see what it looks like at a grade 12 level now. So now you'll see it's using more headings. It's simplifying the language a little bit compared to the previous output. The next demo that I'm going to do is changing this text into Persian. And I can probably use the same Actually, let me just use a different output here to make sure it's clean. So we'll paste that in. And this time I'm gonna act to ask it to translate into Persian. And I will mention that I don't speak or write Persian. So I not, am not able to understand the quality of the output here. So it's now we're able to use the translation to kind of think about translating the format of a particular text. And I would encourage you, if you do speak Persian, please let me know the accuracy of this. And I'm not going to go through these other examples, but it generative AI can be a really powerful tool in terms of adapting um, open educational resources. And when you're online looking at open textbooks in the BC Campus Repository and the Open Stacks Textbook Repository, Repository. There's lots of opportunities to use these texts. One of the challenges is the time it takes to adapt them. The next example I want to show is a little bit of a remix. This is somewhere between a remix and an adaptation. So what I'm doing now is I want to take the same text that I used. But this time, what I'm asking is for generative AI to add specific examples from UBC open courses to the following OER about clear communication. What surprised me about this is generative AI seems to have scraped a lot of the UBC open MOOC courses. And in the past, when I prompted it, it's able to 
link in examples from these particular courses. So again, here's the same language. Now I'm going to ask it to add some examples from UBC MOOCs or Massively Open Online Courses to this text. And we're getting into a little bit of remixing. So now you'll see we're talking about clear communication. Pretty similar text to what it's talked about. But you'll see now it's talking about the UBC MOOC Reconciliation Through Education. And it talks about the use of normative communicative actions to talk about historical and ongoing social norms. Also a flag here, Reconciliation Through Indigenous Education had quite a bit of Indigenous content that wasn't meant to be scraped without attribution but Generative AI has scraped this data and is reusing it. You'll see the next MOOC, UBC Introduction to Systemat Systematic Program Design, and it's talked about the structured video lecture and textbook and reading. And as someone who's helped support some of these MOOCs, these are correct examples from the MOOCs. So just giving you an example of remixing, I've also taken two textbooks pop them together and it was able to remix them into a single text source. So again, over to you this time. And what I'd like you to do is the previous chapter section you created, or you can use the OER that I shared with you, adapt it in two of the ways that I've shared with you. So see if you can translate it into a language that you know, change it into a table format, shift the level for the resource, and again, think of the output quality and the format of the output that you created. And I'm gonna give us four minutes on this again. This is on your worksheet and it's a chance to kind of play with adapting a particular resource. If you wanna challenge yourself, you could even try remixing it with another piece of work. So I'll start our four minute timer now and we can do the same kind of sharing we did before. And again, you can find all of the explanation on the worksheet under activity three. All right, so again, if you can share in the chat how you adapted these resources and maybe the quality of the adaption, if that's helpful. So again, share in the chat how you adapted the resource. Did you change its language? Did you simplify it? Did you make it more complex? and what were the results. And again, if anyone wants to jump on the mic, please feel free to share. Okay, so Nobo mentions, he asked fluid mechanics into Japanese wording and the wordings are accurate. And uh, once again, impressed with that output. Wonderful. How did everyone else do it? Language change as well. Oh, interesting. And Judy, what were the results like for that? You asked it to make clear communication for interdisciplinary teamwork. Um, it's sort of putting a lot of team language in the in the in the revised version. I'm still looking over it. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So was it was it just using the word team, or was it actual? I uh, said kind of that, changing the topic. Yeah, I know. I, I use the clear communication and I say adapt it for university students engaged in teamwork. Um, and, and then I also say that the students are usually from interdisciplinary field. Wonderful. Yes. And du Duncan notes he adapted it for a grade six audience and it does a great job of simplifying. I know one of my favorite prompts to transform text right now is explain it like I'm five for complex text and just have it break down like that. Wonderful, so thanks for doing that. And uh, again, I think so far what we've been doing is we started with doing some creation. We're moving down to think about adapting, remixing. And I wanna shift gears a little bit now and talk about the issues or some of the issues. And I will say that uh, when Will and I talked about planning this session, we, we were kind of debating whether this should be up front or a little bit later. And we wanted to give you a chance to get some hands-on work, but acknowledging there's really significant issues with these technologies now that we need to address critically. 
So let's walk through some of the tensions and issues around these tools. And I'm going to start with this quote from Naomi Klein, who is a professor of geography at UBC now. And I, I really like this quote, thinking about intellectual property. So I'll just give you a moment to read it. And I really like this last paragraph. These models are enclosure and appropriation machines devouring and privatizing our individual lives as well as our collective intellectual and artistic inheritance. So we know now with generative AI, there's multiple lawsuits in the United States about this copyrighted material. We also know from an open perspective that a lot of these um the data that was used was from open work that was meant to be attributed, and it's not. And I think this is an uncomfortable space when we realize just where this data is coming from and the significance of this. And I think when I think of issues, this is kind of the hardest circle for me to square. Um, it, it's really difficult for me to figure out the ethics around using of these tools when so much data has been used without permission. Go ahead, Will. Yeah, so we'll start um, in looking at some of these tensions and issues with copyright. And there's kind of two questions um, around copyright that Gen AI prompts. And so the first one is, can the work created uh, using Gen AI or by, by a AI tool be copyrighted? Um, so copyright is really complex and it's often seen as shades of gray and much of the specifics of copyright get determined through court cases and lawsuits. Um, and this question is really very much in flux. So in August, 2023, there is a landmark ruling in the US that only works with human authors um, can receive copyrights and that content created by AI is not protected under US copyright law. And this Schroeder, um, this Schroeder quote is uh, in regards to that lawsuit. And although Canadian courts have not yet considered whether or not copyright exists in AI-generated work, um, there's a lot of speculation that it doesn't. Um, for example, Victoria Frick of Miguel Law has stated that AI currently appears not to fall under the, the Canadian Copyright Act and is therefore not copyrightable and would this thus exist in the public domain here in Canada as well. But I really just want to say this may change quickly as more and more of these lawsuits are coming forward um, in terms of the, the copyright status of AI generated work. The second question is, um, and, and Lucas touched upon this, is did AI companies break copyright law when they created their training data sets? And I do just wanna say that I think ethically the situation is more complex and that generally I think copyright might be a limited lens for looking at AI um, in terms of copyright and OER. And to explore this, I want to really look um, at a case study of how AI has been traded on OER materials to begin with. Um, so in their white paper, AI, AI Commons, Alec Tarkowski and Susanna Warso of the Open Future Foundations highlighted how the use of openly licensed images, which are clearly a type of OER, was used for data training sets for AI and com computer vision applications, such as uh, facial recognition. Um, in their paper, Tarkowski and Warsaw state that there are, there are two basic approaches um, that companies have used to create AI data sets. And the first one was to really pool, use pools of openly licensed work or OER materials or open uh, materials to ensure that the, the, um, the data sets comply with copyright. And the second approach uh, created the, the data sets by scraping the raw internet and they um, make an argument that the copyright exceptions like transformative use or fair dealing allow them to do that. And that second option is still being sort of determined through the court and lawsuits. Um, so their exploration of the use of open images to train AI really highlights some of the limitations of copyright and openly open license like Creative Commons in this space. So in 2004, um, Flickr became one of the first places for publishing photos on the web. Uh, it was also one of the early adopters of Creative Commons. Um, so as a photographer, I could take a picture and if I uploaded it to Flickr at the, at the moment of upload, I could choose a Creative Commons license to make it open or I could keep it fully um, copyrightable with all rights reserved. Um, it turned out photographers really liked their work to be reused and, share and shared. And by 2014, uh, there was almost 400 million Creative Commons licensed photos on Flickr. 
Uh, that same year, in 2014, researchers from Yahoo Labs, which had bought and, and owned Flickr at that point, as well as researchers from the Lawrence Livermore, Nash Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, um, Snapchat, and maybe somewhat problematically, InQtel, which is a CIA-affiliated venture capitalist firm, used a quarter of these openly licensed images um, to create what they called YC YFCC100M. And that was a data set of 100 million um, openly licensed photographs of people. And it was created specifically for creating computer vision applications like facial recognition. Um, so that data set is interesting because it's generally seen as one of the most significant examples of openly licensed content being reused. Um, so we apply an open um, license to it because there was over 100 million objects in that data set that had these open licenses. It's one of the largest cases of reuse in the history of Creative Commons licenses. Um, and generally, the reuse of this doesn't break any of the terms of Creative Commons licenses. So as part of that data set, a consortium of researchers um, led by the University of Washington, as well as some commercial companies created a, der a derivative data set from that, that 100 million, and they called it Megaface. And this data set included 3 million Creative Commons licensed photographs and is the most relevant data set um, for facial re recognition research. Um, benchmark and training. that The database creators who created the Megaface said their motivation was to even the, the playing field in machine learning and AI. Um, researchers needed enormous amounts of data to train their algorithms, and workers at just a few information-rich companies like Facebook and Google had a big advantage over uh, research institutions and everybody else. Um, so the Megaface data set was seen as a sort of uh, playing field leveler at that point. In 2015 and 2016, the University of Washington ran the Megaface Challenge, and they invited groups of people working on facial recognition technology to use the data to test how well their algorithms were working. Um, the university asked people downloading the data to agree to use it only for non-commercial and educational purposes. And I really think this Megaface database um, became the exemplary of the tensions between open sharing of photographs with copyright tools like Creative Commons licenses and potential harms, mainly related to privacy violations and extractive use of personal data. Um, for the subjects of the photographs that are part of these data sets, the issue is not whether the photos were copyrighted or had, that they had applied Creative Commons license to them or that, you know, that the, if the Creative Commons licenses terms were broken or not in this. But really what, what um, matters to them is the fact that this kind of use was not imagined or expected by them when they attach a Creative Commons license to their photo. And this use um, is often seen as invading their privacy and agency. As Turkowski and Warsaw note, um, voluntary consent um, in research and the right to withdraw at any time has been the gold standard and guiding ethical principles regarding research with humans. And since much of the, the AI data sets were created by research institutions, they sort of end their white paper with a question is, do, what are the ethics of using personal identifiable information to, to um, apply to AI training data? And I think though what the Megaface story shows is there are a lot of new challenges that the open movement faces um, in, in sharing in a changing online environment that and um, some of these new challenges are unexpected and AI is really driving this home. And of course, the use of OER in unintended or extractive areas is not a new thing. Um, as Tarkowski have noted, the paradox of open is uh, that it's both a challenge to and an enabler of concentrations of power. Um, for example, at the beginning of the session during the land acknowledgement, uh, I noted that open can sometimes be in tension with indig indigenous and traditional ways of knowing, and that this tension exists because open is primarily based on copyright and uh, intellectual property law. Uh, Daniel Heath Justice, who's a professor here at UBC in the Department of First Nations and Indigenous Studies, describes the core of the um, the core of the issues this way: knowledge is never about indigenous. Um, knowledge is never just about individuals and it's about communities and it's about gene gene genealogies and it's about history. Community has to be at the heart of our understanding of knowledge production and knowledge dissemination. And when we're talking about many multiple communities in dialogue, then we have to think very much about relationships of power and how power also impacts knowledge production, knowledge maintenance, and also knowledge dissemination. Who decides what should be shared, to what end, and why? These are the kind of questions that are not just about community, but about the tensions that exist between communities and between individuals. 
And I just want to note that there has been some progress in the space of moving beyond thinking only about copyright when it comes to open. Um, and I'll drop the links into this. Um, I'll drop these links in into the chat as well. But an example of this is the traditional knowledge licenses. Um, traditional knowledge licenses identify and clarify community specific rules and responsibilities regarding access and future use of traditional and indigenous, indigenous knowledge. For example, such lic licenses outline traditional protocols associated with access to the materials and invite viewers to respect community protocols or individual or indicate what activities the community has approved as general, generally acceptable. Um, other licenses require direct engagement with the primary cultural authorities of that resource that they're used. Another example that I like, and I'll, let me just drop the chat for the, uh, the TK labels um, into here. Another example that I, I really like where we're seeing progress moving beyond just thinking about copyright are uh, rail licenses. So AI is based on a lot of open source materials, including code, data sets, and algorithms. And rail licenses, which stand for responsible AI licenses, um, allow developers to restrict the use of their AI technology in order to prevent irresponsible and harmful applications. These licenses include behavioral use clauses that go beyond copyright to restrict uses that violate laws, harm or exploit exploit minors, disseminate false information, impersonate others, discriminate based on social behavior or characteristics, or exploit vulnerabilities as, of specific groups of peoples or communities, and, and much, much more. So again, I'm going back to that quote from Paul Stacey, uh, we need to think about moving copyright licenses from simply being open to being open and responsible. And I'll shift it over to you to talk Wonderful. about veracity. Thanks, Will. That was great. And um, thinking about, you know, that that term I mentioned before, that these tools are 100% competent and 70% accurate. And I think um, because of this lack of accuracy, we can get into a lot of challenges with misinformation by releasing things that aren't checked or not having the expertise to check them. So this diagram from UNESCO or flowchart, I'm sure many of you have seen it. Um, I, I, I like the way that it's set up. So it starts, when is it safe to use chat GPT? Does it matter if the output is true? No, well then it's probably safe to use. Yes, do you have the expertise to verify that the output is accurate? And I think this is where it gets quite sticky as a lot of us don't have the expertise um, a lot of you do as faculty, but a lot of people don't have the expertise to validate the content. And so what does this mean when we think about creating open texts? Um, what does it mean for the quality of information online and even the quality of human knowledge? And I just wanted to show you an example which touches on a little bit of what Will was saying, as well as what we're talking about, about accuracy. And this is a fairly... I find this a very chilling example. So my uh, colleague, Carissa Block, shared with this with me. These, This is Instabooks, an AI textbook generator. And these are all the indigenous related textbooks that it's created. And so again, this hasn't been human written. It hasn't been checked. It's not copyrighted. It's using knowledge that... Um, wasn't necessarily intended to be shared. And if you look in a particular book, you'll see now you can buy this book. And if you look on their content policy, their content display disclaimer is, it does not guarantee the correctness or accuracy of the content and disclaims all liabilities for error. So not only do we have copyright here, indigenous knowledge use, we also have potential misinformation and inaccurate knowledge that's now being presented with a legal disclaimer. I also wanted to mention bias and as these technologies have come out and there's more and more studies on them, we're realizing more and more the biases built in with these technologies. And again, when we're thinking about using these to create OER, bias is something we need to pay attention to. So this is from a study by Vassal et al. And what they noticed is the generative AI models, including ChatGPT4, Claude 2, Llama 2, so a couple different models 
can produce content that negatively impacts the so psychosocial well-being of users, particularly those from marginalized group. And in particular, they found that it generates biased and stereotypical narratives for certain groups, and it also erased certain groups. So there was eraser within its database. So as we're looking at these tools, as we're looking at using these technologies, I think it's important that we bring a lot of what's being called a value of judgment to these spaces. So how are we evaluating the bias? How are we evaluating the expertise, sorry, the accuracy, and who's able to make these decisions? This is another example of bias. Um, on two different occasions, I searched chat GPT for a portrait of a typical Canadian family. And this is the output that I've got. It seems to be a little bit better. I did it today and got a little bit more of a diverse outcome. But often previous to this, I would always be getting this sort of output. Uh, Mid Journey, which is another image creation tool. If you search uh, computer scientist, professor, you'll always get a 50-year-old 50, 50 male with glasses and a beard. I don't mean you well. And finally, privacy. And as, as we've talked about today, we can copy paste, we can add resources into these tools. And what that's doing is creating a significant privacy problem. This reminds me to date myself of kindly the early days of the internet, when we were putting lots and lots and lots online without really thinking of the privacy implications for it. And maybe I'll get a thumbs up for those of you who have heard about the Poem Forever privacy hack. I'm sharing this because it's a good example of the privacy limitations of these tools, as well as the vulnerability of these tools right now. So. A couple months ago, a Google researcher asked ChatGPT to write the word poem forever. And it started off saying poem, 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 poem. But then I think in the background, it was saying things like cannot compute. And instead of sharing poem, 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 it started sharing personal information from its login database. So this is an example of the vulnerability of these tools in terms of privacy. Not only do we know that the data that we're putting into them is often used for training, we also know that these tools are, as of now, quite leaky. And so thinking about the institutional, the private data, the student data that we might be putting into these tools, we need to think about how to use them cautiously. We can also think of equity. Um, right now, we're in a situation where a lot of students are able to use these tools in very different ways than other students. So while some students might be new to these tools and creating generic outputs, other students can make these tools sing. We also know that uh, with the exception of ChatGPT for Omega, which is now free, the more higher quality tools are often behind paywalls, and I would expect this will continue. Finally, the possibility to create and control Gen AI is out of reach of most companies and most countries, especially those in the global south. Finally, with equity, we're getting into the area of disruption. Will AI replace human TAs? A university in the States recently, during a TA strike, sent a note to professors suggesting that they use generative AI while their students are on, while their TAs are on strike. Um, what jobs are going to be impacted? What sort of disruption can we expect? And I'm going to turn it back over to Will. Hopefully, we've touched on some of the critical issues with these tools. And I think some, like privacy, are a little bit easier to get my head around, at least, and think about ways we can use these tools with privacy in mind. But questions like copyright are uh, quite a bit stickier, and we need to make ethical choices around how we use them. Go ahead, Will. And uh, just before I, I dig in, Duncan had, had uh, posted a link to Nightshade um, and a question about it in the chat. And if you're not familiar with Nightshade, 
Um, it is a tool um, that basically was created by the University of Chicago that it, the idea is artists can add um, the, the basic, um, can basically add this to their content, particularly images, and then it poisons the AI training. So if you have a picture of a dog and you add this sort of nightshade layer to it, it will, and people ask to create a dog, like the, the data has been corrupted on the back end and, and the AI won't be able to create a, a dog. Um, there's been other tools like this. Glaze is another one um, out there. And I think the question, you know, to me, it's really interesting and it's not surprising that these tools are coming forth. And in one way, they they remind me about um, about like ad blockers on browsers and, and the fact that, you know, these are tools that are fighting against ad, intrusive ads, but they actually haven't slowed down the increasing of ads at all. So I think we're in this very early days and we'll see. Um, we'll see more of these tools come out that try to put control back in the hands of users to fight against um, their use being being uh, appropriated, their content being appropriated by by AI companies. Uh, but but whether that's effective or actually makes any any difference, I think is yet to be seen. I don't know if that answers your question, Duncan. Um, so. Going back to this idea, so we've gone through some of the issues and challenges, and I want to look back at the textbook section and the quiz that you've created. Um, and I, th I think the first question I want to ask is, what are these ready to be published as OER? Um, what would need to be done to make this as OER? Um, and then the follow-up question to this is, uh, should it be made into to OER? Um, do we have the rights to take this content that's been generated by, by a Gen AI? Um, and turn it into a openly shared resource that gets published um, out there. And then how do we reconcile the power of these tools with the ethical issues and goals of OER and the open educational community of empowering these? And um, finally, would you or have you used Gen AI to, to make OER mm -hmm. is sort of a question. So looking at these particular first two questions, I just wanna take a minute and have you reflect upon those first two questions and drop your responses into the chat. Or again, please feel free to take over the, the, um, the mic and let us know your thoughts on this. Sorry, um, my, sorry, my computer glitch. Um, my would say is the answer is no, not ready yet. It's just too fast, too quick. I think a few things that I need to do is to, to um, really think about the course, who is it for? Is it hitting the right tone? I need to see, and then I think I need to assess how big the OER is it going to be? Is it for the whole course? Then I will have to have multiple chapters. And once I start making it bigger, then I need to make sure that they all the chapter aligns. So I would say right now not ready, just because I don't I don't have a clear goal in mind. Um should it be made into OER? I don't know. <laughs> um it's not ready. And so it'd be my, maybe, maybe I have to look through everything and check, fact chat everything. And then maybe it will be, maybe it's ready, um, but not now. So let me, let me uh, flip that over to Novo, who you saw lots of um, really impressive outputs with the fluid dynamics. Do you, do you feel like this would be ready to put in front of students? Well, frankly speaking, yes. It is a super, super useful tool. And the thing is, actually, the fluid mechanics is very classical. So it really can't go wrong. And the checking is relatively straightforward. So truly, I mean, today's uh, workshop is uh, uh, eye-opening to me. I mean, <laughs> that makes my life a lot simpler. And uh, it's, again, um, everybody can check it in terms of the putting up an uh, OER because it is relatively straightforward. Uh, in terms of the ethical issue, that is uh, a little bit shaky ground. Um, I think everybody got the similar kind of uh, impression. Yeah, but it, yeah, it's again and again. I'm truly impressed. I mean, this is eye-opening and it's almost like a scary because uh, maybe I don't need to be in the university anymore. <laughs> anyway, thank you so much. That was uh, wonderful. No, no, thank you for that. And, and I think what's what's interesting is I feel like a lot of comments around this content uh, or around AI, uh, Gen AI content echoes what was a lot of the discussions around OER in the very early days is like, oh, if there's these OER videos, do I really need to lecture? Um, and if there's <laughs> these OER books out there, 
um, you know, wh what is the purpose of expertise? And it turns out expertise is, is really about, um, in some ways, being able to, to um, know the, the content is good and be able to recommend it right. and being able to adapt it and, and share it in the right way. Adele. Yeah, uh, as, a, as a foreign language instructor, when you deal with text, even in your own language, texts have so many layers, and then you have a multicultural class setting. Uh, there is not a, the answer, and uh, sometimes you have to walk a fine line that you hit the right tone in, in way of interpretation, and there are historical, cultural issues within a text, so yes, as some input, yes, but right now I would feel like I'm walking on eggshells and I wouldn't feel very comfortable. So when you look at technology or maybe at math, two, two and two is four, you know, but uh, when you read a text and deal with a different language, uh, I find it quite challenging. Okay, that's my input. <laughs> yeah. And, and again, I think, the question of the role of expertise in, in helping understand that is, is really important. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Vivian in the comments says, I wonder how chapters written separately might connect to one another. Might there be issues with content that not, not uh, jiving or connecting together in a way. And I think, I think that's a good question. If you're, you, does, does Gen AI content need editors? Um, and it, and I think Miriam speaks to this directly. It gives a good starting point. Um, it's good because it gives ideas and how to organize a chapter. Um, but you'd still want to rework it and think it. And I think I think that echoes where I'm at these days with the idea of using Gen AI to create create OER. Um, we do want to talk about like what sort of is happening in OER in the future and what what Gen AI is going to change things. Um, I'm just, thanks, Lucas. Um, we're just going to talk a little bit about future directions. And I want to go back to to David Wiley, um, who's been talking about this area quite a bit. Um, so Wiley again is the um, one of the early scholars that applied the ideas of open source software to educational content. And he has a question that he's asked is, what if in the future, educators didn't write textbooks at all? What if instead we only wrote structured collections of highly crafted prompts? And in the blog post where he asked this question, um, he argues that there's um, the Bloom's two sigma problem. So Bloom and colleagues basically demonstrated that the average student, um, and this applies across both like um, well-performing and less performing students um, that are tutored full-time outperform 98% of students who learn in traditional just classroom lecture settings. And he says tutoring is an incredibly powerful teaching method and AI mainly make AI may make this idea of tutoring broadly available at a reasonable cost. And should we be moving um, towards that direction? Um, so I'm going to demonstrate a prompt that he, he, um, asked, and I'm going to ask you to do this, the, um, the same prompt. Um, so this is a, rather than have our chapter on this, the sleep of psychology, I'm going to ask, um, chat GTP to act as a tutor for me in this area. Um, so I'm going to share my screen again, really quickly. I'm going to go back to chat GTP. Um, I'm going to just ask it a new quiz question or a new um, question just to start fresh. And I'm going to say, um, create five questions that will under, that will test my understanding of the psychology of sleep. Ask me the questions one at a time, wait for my answer, and then give me feedback. Then ask the next question. Um, so we'll see what it says. It says, sure, let's start with the first question. What are the primary stages of the sleep cycle? And what, what are the characteristics for each stage? Um, I'm going to say there's NRM sleep, NR, REM, and I don't know any others. And then it's going to come back and tell me what these stages are um, and walk through them. And then it's going to ask me uh, a, a follow-up question. What role does REM sleep play in cognitive functions and overall health? So it's expecting me to know a little bit of information. So maybe I could have engineered my prompt um, to say, you know, provide me a quick overview of the five stages of REM sleep and then ask, ask me five questions that will test my understanding of this. But the idea of shifting away from text to dialogue um, and, and will that sort of 
shift into more less textbooks and more tutoring approaches for OER, I think is a really interesting question. And I think it's one that's happening really fast. And I just want to sh show this example. Um, if you haven't seen this before, uh, in the current version of chat GTP, you have this button here that, that says explore on um, GTPs. So if I click on this, I go into it and I just type in UBC, what you're going to see is there's students out there creating um, tutor-like GTPs for their courses. Um, I'm just going to pick one um, randomly, EOSC uh, 114. And this is, uh, I assume, created by a student that's been shared here. This is not the instructor of this course. Um, conversate, and it, they've got conversation starters. So explore the concept of plate tech talk tectonics on this. So rather than going out and reading a um, textbook, I'm now getting prompts um, that a student has created based on a specific course. And it's going to go through, give me the, these, um, the sort of overview, again, sort of basic, what I would call um, first year textbook style overview. Um, I'm going to say something like, I don't understand um, C floor spreading. Can you let me know more? Um, and I'll go in and do this deep dive into it. So, so we're moving beyond, again, this idea of um, thinking about OER as solely a static um, text to more thinking about a dialogue that we're having with this. And I think this raises all sorts of interesting questions. I'm just going to stop sharing my screen for a sec. Um, and we're kind of running out of time. Um, so maybe we won't do, we'll save some time for questions at the end and we won't ask you to, to create this, but it's in your workbook or in that worksheet if you want um, to create a prompt like that where you basically create five questions or um, test my understanding of the topic, ask me the five the questions one at a time, wait for my answer and to give me feedback. And you're more than welcome to to try that out on its own. Um, one of the 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 uh, things that I find interesting about this is we know that if you're outputting the content and you can put it in the formats like an open textbook, that's definitely OER. But if you're asking students to engage directly in with a chat GTP service or another Gen AI service, you're now asking, you're shifting it away from what I would call open content or the possibility of open content to, to putting people into a um, into an actual platform and into an actual service. Um, so what can be open about that? And I think some of the prompts you can be open. Um, so again, uh, what David Wiley says is rather than writing textbooks, maybe we're just writing the proper, um, the gen AI prompts or that, or the API calls um, that allows students to use any tool to to have this tutor-like experience. Um, so with that, Lucas, do you have anything else you wanted to add? No, I mean, I just want to add kind of a final summary, if that's okay. So, you that's know, perfect. we've we've touched on, I think we touched a little bit on what OER is, what generative AI is. We jumped in and we you created a textbook chapter a part of a textbook created a quiz and we looked at how that linked into other tools like h5p and then we talked about ways that we can use generative ai to adapt uh, remix create oer we talked about some of the substantial issues and then we ended off talking about kind of where this might be going and i know the new microsoft future of works report which i've read quite a bit again talks about this potential movement from content to dialogue and what that might mean and you know most of all i really appreciate the enthusiasm and the sharing of this group today it was a really rich discussion so we can open it up to questions if you have anything um otherwise thanks so much for coming today it was uh, uh inspiring to hear from all of you. Um, yeah. yeah, thank you. I, I agree with some of the comments that are already rolling in. This is excellent. And I really appreciate your expertise and your time. Um, I, so I, I think I share some people's like that hesitation, ambivalence um, about 
taking something generated like this and putting it directly into an OER. Do you know of people at UBC that have done this uh, successfully or that, that are kind of leading the way in this? Or are, are there practical examples that will maybe inspire us or help us get over that, that reluctance to, to, to rely on these tools that way? I would say from my end, I, I'm not aware of, of that. Um, and I think rightfully so. I think there's a lot of, uh, you know, still sort of exploration of some of these tensions that exist in there and some hesitation to, to go this route. I will also say, I think there are some people who are doing it, but just not, you know, they're using it again as a writing tool, um, but they're doing that sort of editing and, and work, but using it to help them, you know, get get started or transform language or or that that aspect as well. So. Um, but if, if anybody knows of exemplars, I would love to to know about, about them as well. So. And I'm seeing I, I it a lot was, in the uh, teaching and learning, like uh, resources for teaching and learning, not necessarily open. So for example, makeup quizzes is an area that I've seen here and there. Folks coming to me to get some help generating a makeup quiz for a student who was unable to make their first quiz. Um, case studies, so folks generating uh, those sort of resources, I haven't seen it yet in the OER space, though. Sorry, go ahead, Duncan. Oh, I was just going to say, I, I know of, um, there, there was a, a pretty, I, I couldn't find a reference to it, but there was a case of a prof falsely being accused of using ChatGPT to write a paper when it got rejected from a, a journal. And um, so, yeah, <laughs> I, I if I had the example, it would be more useful. But um, yeah, I, I guess this is still a very contested space and we'll just see how things go. But um, this is very inspiring to, uh, to how to use these tools more effectively. So thank you. Yeah, and, and thank you. And I, I I think, you know, like all tools, like a critique of them is, is always appropriate. Um, but if they make, you know, basically the outcomes of what we want for open is removing barriers to teaching and learning and empowering students and instructors if they accomplish that goal, um, they shouldn't necessarily not be explored and critiqued as well. Any other questions? We'll share again the recordings and slides with you. Yeah, Mariam. I had a quick question about privacy because I noticed that in um, chat GPT, there is in the settings, you can actually click um, that you don't want whatever you're putting in there to be used for um, the tool to remember and learn from. Um, so how does that actually work? It's a good question. I don't know beyond that they say it works at this point. I would assume that it stops it from being used within its training database, but that doesn't necessarily stop like the Poem Forever leak I mentioned, that's not necessarily the same thing. That could be getting into a, a different data vulnerability than its use in training data. So it, I think at this point, at least from my knowledge, it's it's fairly difficult to know. And I see Halimat's in the room um, who knows quite a bit about AI as well. Halimat, did you have any comments on kind of the privacy around generative AI and how whether you ask it to be used in training data, what sort of difference that would make offhand? Okay, well, maybe we'll leave that. So yeah, in short, I, I would assume that it means it won't be used in its training database, but it doesn't talk about the overall privacy of the data at this point. All right, well, thanks so much today. Again, we'll follow up with you and we really appreciate your time.